behind the world. Hello, and welcome to Motivational Interviewing with People Who Use Drugs. This is a webinar uh, collaboration between Harm Reduction Coalition and Behavioral Health Services Baltimore. We're really excited that you've joined us today. My name is Casey Bitchett, and I am a Capacity Building Services Manager at Harm Reduction Coalition. Harm Reduction Coalition is an organization that was founded in 1993 by people who use drugs, sex workers, certain service providers, and their friends and loved ones. We do work in these five areas. We do policy and advocacy work, advocating for syringe access to be legal in all 50 states and for low barrier access to medication as treatment, such as methadone and suboxone. We also do a lot of training and capacity building, which you're experiencing right now. Uh, but we don't just do webinars, we do in-person training. And if you're interested in knowing more about that, you can always visit our website, armreduction.org. We do a lot of overdose and prevention overdose prevention and advocacy work. So making sure that people have low barrier access to naloxone. Um, and we also in our Oakland office run the DOPE project, the Drug Overdose Prevention Education Project, which is the largest naloxone distributor in San Francisco. We have national and regional conferences. Our national conference in particular is very popular. It happens every two years, and the next one is in October of 2020 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, our conferences are a lot of fun. They are entirely abstract driven, so if there's something new to hear and see every two years. We also have a soccer game, a fashion show, and a dance party. Um, they are educational, but also a great way to make new friends and contacts in our production. Uh, and both Harm Reduction Coalition's website and Behavioral Health Services Baltimore's website have a number of resources and publications that you can check out if you are curious about anything that you hear today and want to learn more. Finally, about two, two or three years ago, Harm Reduction Coalition introduced a North Star Statement to guide our work. And that statement is that Harm Reduction Coalition creates spaces for dialogue and action that help heal the harms caused by racialized drug policies. So as more and more attention is turned towards the current overdose crisis, we want to recognize that people in communities of color have, and people of color have been punitively impacted by drug policies in this country both in terms of being incarcerated at higher rates and dying from overdose at higher rates for many, many years. Um, people, communities of color have experienced really punitive impacts of our drug policies, and we want to work to help heal those harms and to, um, to change policies so that they're not racialized and they are inclusive of respecting everyone's health and dignity, regardless of whether they use drugs and regardless of the color of their skin. Now we'll hop into our workshop overview. So at the end of this training, we hope that you'll be able to define, define motivational interviewing, interviewing, discuss the stages of change theory and how it relates to your work, and integrate motivational interviewing as another tool that you use to engage people who use drugs effectively. Uh, we have a quick glossary for you. PWID stands for people who inject drugs, PWUD, people who use drugs, and PLWHA, people living with HIV AIDS. We want to always acknowledge people's personhood, hence the people first language. Uh, people are more than their behaviors, more than the substances that they choose to put in their body, and more than their chronic conditions, and we always want to recognize and center that. STI stands for Sexually Transmitted Infection. This is updated language from STD because infection is less stigmatized a word than disease, uh, and most STIs are curable or very treatable now. Um, SAS stands for syringe access services and SSP for syringe services programs. We use this language rather than SEP, which is the 
the old language standing for a syringe exchange program because first of all, a one-to-one -one exchange is not best practice for syringe services or syringe access. We want people to have access to all of the syringes they need, regardless of how many they're returning to a program. And then also syringe service programs do a lot more than give out syringes. They have other substance use supplies like snorting and smoking supplies. They have drop-in centers where people can stay, can sit down and feel safe. They offer testing, medical care, medication as treatment, um, lots of counseling, and linkages to care. So we want to acknowledge the depth and breadth of those services. That said, a little shout out to our history. MEX, needle exchange, is one of those older terms. Um, and it's a term that lots of folks who use drugs and folks who were founders in this movement used. So we keep it in our glossary. Uh, this isn't in our glossary, but because it's a motivational interviewing training, I also just want to throw in that you'll see MI which is motivational interviewing just abbreviated. All right. So what is motivational interviewing? Well, motivational interviewing is a collaborative and person-centered counseling style. Um, so it's a counseling style that works with rather than at our participants or clients um, and centers their expertise. What motivational interviewing wants to do is elicit and strengthen motivation for behavior change. So pull out those threads of change people might want to make and then explore and resolve ambivalence about that change. So figure out what is stopping people from making change and try to resolve that, stop, that conflict. Ambivalence is a word that you'll see come up a lot throughout this training, and so we wanted to define it for y'all. Ambivalence means having mixed feelings about something or being unable to choose between different courses of action. Usually, these two opposing thoughts are conflicting towards an action. So it's like, I want to stop smoking, but I really don't. Or I should go to the gym in the morning, but I also should sleep in. Um, or I would love to start eating more vegetables, but man, I haven't tried the Popeye's chicken sandwich yet. All examples of ambivalence. The goal of motivational interviewing is to elicit self-motivational statements from the client about change and to direct these statements towards change. So basically that means you want to pull out statements that the client or participant makes about their ability to change and have a conversation around those statements and about around the changes they want to make and their perceived ability to change in hopes that they will make a healthy change. Some key areas of motivational interviewing are self-esteem so we want our clients to have a positive self-regard or high self-esteem and belief that they can achieve change. Uh, some concerns. So we want our clients or participants to be concerned with their health and well-being, um, which, you know, they probably are because most people are concerned with their health and well-being. Um, competence. So we want our clients or participants to feel like they have the ability and the tools that they need to change. Um, knowledge of problems and strategies. So want folks to be knowledgeable about what it is that they're experiencing and the variety of strategies they might use to make a change. And a desire to change. We can't make people change if they don't want to. If someone comes to us and says, I am never going to stop doing drugs and never going to stop doing, doing heroin, then it's not on us to, to try to convince them to stop. They've just made a statement that's very clear about whether or not they have a desire to change. If someone comes to us and says, I'll never stop using heroin unless I get housed, then maybe we can explore that ambivalence around 
stopping heroin when they're unhoused and what could help make that change, right? Uh, we also want to talk about the spirit of motivational interviewing. The spirit of motivational interviewing includes collaboration, evocation, and autonomy. And we're going to talk in depth about each one of these terms. So collaboration. Motivational interviewing is a partnership. It is not a provider doing something at or providing a service at a participant or client. It is about working with someone in the process of change. This is why, uh, this is part of the reason why I prefer the word participant over client, right? To me, client implies doing to or providing to, and participants are participating in the services that they are receiving. So from here on out, I'm going to use the language of participant. Um, so in motivational interviewing, we want to collaborate with our participants and recognize that they are the expert in their lives and they know themselves best. Um, and we want to explore how we can work with them to support making a change rather than coerce change. Evocation is the resources and motivation for change are presumed to reside within the participant. That's what evocation means. So intrinsic motivation for change is enhanced by drawing on that internal motivation for change. So by drawing on the participant's goals, perceptions, and values. What does this mean really? It means that when we are practicing motivational interviewing with a participant, conversations are about understanding the participant's reasons for change. They're about understanding the, the ambivalence that participants have around change. They're not about providing or projecting our own reasons as providers. So using the example I brought up earlier of maybe I'd quit heroin if I were housed, right? It's about understanding what heroin does for that person when they're living on the street. It's about understanding why this is difficult to change to make when the person is not housed. It's not about us as providers saying, well, it's risky to do heroin regardless of whether you're housed or not, right? It's about listening to and understanding where our participants are coming from. And finally, autonomy. Um, the, the person, the practitioner or provider is always going to affirm the participant's right and capacity for self-direction and they're going to just facilitate informed choice. So we as providers recognize that participants are the experts in their own minds and we validate their ability to make the right choice for themselves right now. So as motivational interviewing providers, we accept that the participant has the power to make their own choices, including to change their behavior right now, but also to not change their behavior right now or to change their behavior tomorrow or next week or Frankly, never. We validate our participants' rights to choice, and we validate that whatever choice our participant is making is the right choice for them in the moment. Now, let's talk through some motivational interviewing practices or some best practices for things to do while, we're, while we are providing motivational interviewing to participants. First, we want to express em empathy. Then we want to develop discrepancy. We also want to roll with resistance. And we want to support self-efficacy. So expressing empathy. We want to demonstrate an accurate understanding of the participant's perspective. We want to, as you might say, or as this picture implies, take a, take a proverbial walk or in our metaphorical walk in our participants' shoes. We want to understand what they're going through. We want to make sure that we have an accurate understanding of their perspective. So if we if they say something that we don't quite understand, we may rephrase it and say, what what I'm hearing is XYZ. Did I get that right? We want to always give them the opportunity to correct us if we do not have an accurate understanding of what they're telling us or of what their perspective 
questions. We also want to develop discrepancy. So we want to highlight inconsistencies between the participants' broader goals and values and their current behavior, right? So a good example of this might be, man, I know I, I just keep getting getting sick and I know I've been coughing a lot lately, and but I I love smoking. I love smoking cigarettes, right? Maybe maybe in that situation we would say, I hear you that you really that you really like smoking cigarettes and it that feels important to you. It's something you value. But it also sounds like you value not getting sick and you think there might be a link between the, the amount you smoke and how sick you've been getting lately, right? So we want to develop that discrepancy. We want to roll with resistance. So if we start feeling frustrated with the client um, in terms of what they're saying or doing, then we want to use it as an, an opportunity to invite the clients to discuss reasons that prevent change rather than, and then work with them around these issues rather than instructing or fighting them. Right? So in that example I gave earlier, if someone's like, man, I, I know cigarettes have been making me sick and I know that they've been making me cough more and I don't like that, but I, I really love my cigarettes, then it's about saying, okay, I hear you that you really love your cigarettes. What, what do you love about smoking? What does it do for you, right? We want to understand what that ambivalence is on both sides. So roll with that resistance. Types of resistance might include arguing, so contesting the, contesting the accuracy, expertise, or integrity of the provider. So it might be statements like, you don't care about me, you just want me to quit smoking, or you just want me to quit drinking, um, or you don't know what's true. You don't like, you don't know if it's true that smoking is unhealthy for me, might be arguing, right? Interrupting, so interrupting in a defensive manner. So maybe you're trying to summarize what the participant said and they interrupt defensively. I didn't say that, don't put words in my mouth, things like that. Denying, so unwillingness to, to, unwillingness to recognize problems, cooperate, accept responsibility or take advice. So yeah, yeah, I know that I said I wanted to, I, I know that I, wanted to make that doctor's appointment, but you know, I, th there was, there was really bad traffic. The bus was late. I, I couldn't do it. It's, you know, it, it, it's, it's always, it's always the subway's fault. That's why I can't make my appointment. It's just, you know, the subway is always making me late, right? So denying or not accepting responsibility and then ignoring, ignoring or not following the provider. So maybe you say something to them and they completely ignore what you've said or they change the topic completely. In rolling with resistance, when people do these things, we don't want to respond by fighting them or by going against them. We want to respond by, as the, na as the name of this technique implies, rolling with it, right? So someone's arguing with us about the accuracy of what we're saying. Someone says, you don't know that cigarettes are bad for me. And okay, sounds like you've heard some stuff about the health benefits of cigarettes. Can you tell me? Ah. Someone interrupts in a defensive manner when we're summarizing what they're saying. Okay, I hear you, I misunderstood you. Can you explain to me um, so that I can better understand? Denying or not accepting responsibility. I hear you that you're saying the subway is making you late. That must be really frustrating. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the trouble you've been having with the train? And if they're ignoring or ignoring what we're saying completely or changing the topic or not following us, seems like you want to talk about something else. We can do that. All examples of rolling with resistance. Finally, motivational interviewing supports self-efficacy. So, we as providers want to foster independent decision-making 
and reinforce the person's belief and perception that they're capable of mastering goals. We want our participants to be and to believe that they are self-reliant and that they are capable of making the changes that they talk about making and they say that they want to make. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we do motivational interviewing? How do we engage, right? There are three components of engagement. First of all, we want to build rapport with individuals. Then we want to assess and resolve any barriers to engaging. This says to engaging in testing. Maybe we're, we're engaging with someone who is resistant to testing, but we want to assess and resolve any barriers to changing. And finally, we want to establish expectations and agreements with our participants so that everything is clear. So building rapport. Rapport is a state of understanding with another individual that enables more effective communication. So it's building a type of intimacy where folks can communicate with each other and trust each other. Some ways to build rapport might be mirroring body language, mirroring the tone of voice, uh, and mirroring the rate of speech. So if someone is sitting with their body pretty open to us, then maybe we wanna mirror their body language and not cross our arms or cross our legs. We wanna um, mirror what they're doing. Um, if someone's speaking calmly to us, we wanna speak calmly back, mirror their vocal tone. Uh, the, the one time I would say mirroring may not help to build rapport is if someone is speaking to us from a place of anger, we don't want to, and we want to remember rolling with resistance. We don't want to respond in a tone of anger. Um, and rate of speech. So if someone is speaking to us really quickly, then maybe we speak really quickly back. Rapport is also built by reflective listening. So it's built by listening actively to what our participant is saying and responding by giving little summary statements uh, or by asking them questions, right? So I think what I heard you say is, or can I give you a summary of what I heard? Would be some examples of demonstrating that you've been listening reflectively. We wanna assess and, assault, assess and resolve any potential barriers they have to making change. Right? So part of this means discussing past experiences that where they have attempted to make this particular change. So let's say our participant wants to start using a sterile syringe for every injection, but they have been sharing syringes a lot or reusing syringes a lot. So, hey, I hear you that you want to you want to use a sterile syringe for every injection, that's great. Have you ever tried this before? How, how did it work out when you tried this in the past? And if they have tried it before, if they've, they've had past successes with it, we want to focus on that, right? We don't want to take away any time people have achieved having made these changes, right? So I'll give a really good example of this, um, or what I hope is a good example of this. I, when I was working at a syringe service program, I had a participant who um, had not smoked crack or used cocaine in five years. However, she lived with a cocaine dealer. Um, he was her partner. Her partner had promised her that he was not storing any of the cocaine he was selling in their home because he knew that it was not good for, their, for her recovery or that it might make her recovery more challenging. Um, but one day she found some of his supply in their home and she snorted some of it. And the next day she came to me and she was really upset with herself and really disappointed and um, she explained to me that's because she had been 
in at pre, during previous recovery attempts, she hadn't been engaging in harm reduction counseling. She had been going to AANNA. Now there's nothing wrong with AANNA, but she was coming from this place of, well, I, I did it, I, I did it. I, I snorted some cocaine, now I'm back to day one. I've lost all my quote, clean time. But what I said to her is, hey, you were you went five years without using cocaine or crack. I don't, that time still counts. What worked for you in those five years? What what worked? What what would help you get back to the place you want to be at? I also highlighted that she you know snorted a little bit and to her partner's disappointment threw out the rest. Right. So hey, you recognize that this wasn't something you wanted to do, and you made a change to make sure that it wasn't available to you as an option anymore, right? So focusing on successes rather than on failures. If people have made attempts in the past, then we wanna highlight those. Great. There was a time when you went three months without sharing a syringe. What, what, was, what made that possible in that time? Or wow. <laughs> you have cut down from a pack of cigarettes today to a, a pack of cigarettes a day to half a pack of cigarettes a day how do you do that celebrating and focusing on those successes we also want to offer options right so we want to let people know that um they they have options in their goal setting goal setting is not black and white maybe they don't want to entirely stop, they don't want to entirely stop using, but they want to cut back. You can talk with them about whether they'd be willing to cut back or whether cutting back is a potential goal of theirs or whether it's not. Um, and we want to assess their readiness to commit. So we want to understand not just if they want to commit, but if they are ready to commit. That person who comes to us and says, I won't be able, I." will not stop quitting as long as I'm living, or I will not stop using as long as I am living on the streets. They've communicated to, to us, they've communicated to us really clearly that there is a barrier to being readiness to, to be, there is a barrier to being ready to change. So maybe the first step in working with them isn't about practicing motivational interviewing around their desire to stop using or not, but is about linking them to housing. Uh, and we also want to establish expectations and agreements. So we, different, we have different roles and responsibilities and we want to be clear about those. The provider's role is to ask questions and to listen actively and reflectively. And the participant's role is to talk about the changes they want to make and we want to be sure that we are putting appropriate boundaries on those roles. Um, we also want to communicate openly, right? So if a participant asks us a question that we don't feel we can answer with while staying in the boundaries of our role as provider, we can say, hey, you know, I really can't answer that question, but why is it important for you to know that? Or if it's a question we could answer but aren't sure we want to, can you tell me more about why you would you want to know that? Um, we also want to put our personal values aside, right? So no matter what we think, we want to support our participants' goals and behavior. So if we are engaged in abstinence-based recovery and we think that is the best form of recovery, we have to put that aside if we're working with someone who doesn't want to stop using but wants to change their behaviors around using or use less. If we think that smoking is incredibly unhealthy and that people should not smoke, we need to put that aside if we're working with someone who's setting goals around their smoking. Um, we, we need to put our personal values and judgments aside when we are providing care to others. That is that is a huge part of being a harm reductionist is practicing non-judgment. Um, and then we 
absolutely 100% need to practice confidentiality. What the participant tells us should stay with us. And depending on our agency or organizational rules, our clinical supervisor or coworkers, um, but we need to respect HIPAA. We need to respect that we cannot share participants' personal information with other participants or with our family or friends um, and that work workplace confidentiality and HIPAA apply here. Um, we also need to understand that confidentiality doesn't work both ways. So when we're talking about the roles and responsibilities of provider versus participant in that open communication, if the participant asks a question that we feel comfortable answering, we also need to feel comfortable with the idea that that participant might share our answer with other participants. So in the objectives for this webinar, we talked about understanding the stages of change and how they apply to our work. So you may have seen the stages of change before. They are pretty commonly talked about in harm reduction and substance use treatment worlds. Um, but they are basically stages people go through while contemplating making a change or while making a change. So pre-contemplation, is not considering it. Contemplation means someone's thinking about a change. Preparation, someone's planning to do it. Action, someone is actually doing it. Um, I've heard most people think that action is a three month phase, so, or a six month, three to six month phase. So for three to six months, they are actually doing it. And then after those first three to six months, maybe they move into maintenance or staying with it. Um, and re return or relapse or lapse means they stop doing it. They stop having made that change. They return to the old behavior. Um, I really like that there are arrows going both ways throughout this and that this is in a circle, but I also wish there were arrows pointing from lapse to preparation and from contemplation to action and from action to pre-contemplation, right? Because these stages of change are kind of inaptly Named. They're not really, they are, they are and can be stages. People certainly can move through these stages in the exact way they're laid out, but people also can jump around. Uh, someone who has experienced a lapse, for example, the person who I spoke about earlier who used cocaine once after five years of not using cocaine, she experienced a lapse, but then she, she didn't go into preparation, she didn't go into contemplation, she didn't go into pre-contemplation, she didn't return to using every day as she had been five years before. She went straight back into, I don't use cocaine and that's a decision I've made for myself. She went straight back into maintenance, I would argue. Some people would say she went straight back into action. Some people would say by getting rid of the cocaine that her partner had at their house, she went straight into preparation, but she certainly didn't just go straight back to pre-contemplation and have to repeat all the steps is what I wanna emphasize here. So again, these are the stages of change. Um, I know that for me, it helps to work through them with an example. So I will do that for you all. Um, so, Let's use the example of someone who has never had an HIV test, someone who injects drugs and has never had an HIV test. So not considering it pre-contemplation, that person is offered an HIV test at the drop-in of the syringe service program they go to. They automatically go, nope, I don't want one. Don't ask me again. Contemplation. Maybe a couple months go by and they are in a health workshop offered by the nurse at the syringe service program. And that, that day's health workshop, that day's topic for health workshop is HIV. And they join the workshop and they ask lots of questions about what it means to live with HIV and about the process of being tested for HIV. So they're asking questions. They're thinking, hey, maybe, maybe I am open to having a test, but I'm not sure. Then preparation, 
they're planning to do it. So maybe they talk to their counselor about doing it, about exactly what it would be like. Action would, of course, be doing it. Maintenance, in this case, would be if they, let's say they test non-reactive, maintenance is coming back and being tested every three to six months as recommended. And then return or relapse, maybe one six month or a three month period later, they don't come back. Um, but then they fall right back into action because they come back three months after that. So there's an example of stages of change. And we will go through each one of these individually as well. So pre-contemplation, or as you can see, I see no reason to change. The participant has no intention of changing. They may not believe that there are benefits. So for example, I am homeless and I know that when I use heroin, I feel warmer, I feel more able to sleep, and I don't feel as hungry. What would be the benefits to put in heroin while I am homeless? Maybe an example of that. They may perceive too many barriers or disadvantages, right? So I would love to use a new and sterile syringe with every injection, but I live 45 minutes from the syringe service program. It's only open a few hours a week. Those hours are either when I'm at work or when I have to get my kids to school. How could I possibly make the time to make sure that I have a new and sterile syringe every time? Or maybe their syringe service program has a one-to-one -one policy. Any, any number of things, right? But there are too many barriers. It doesn't feel possible. Or they may or may not possess the skills necessary to change. I would say skills and tools necessary to change, right? So an example of this may be someone who does not know how to inject themselves and is always injected by a trusted partner um, and doesn't want to make that change because they don't know how to safely inject themselves. Often we describe these folks as non-compliant or as difficult, but in reality, they just have made a decision that's different than the decision that we think is best for them. And this is, again, where we really need to put our judgments aside. We cannot come at people with an agenda. If someone has made a decision to not change their behavior right now, we can certainly ask questions to better understand why but we cannot be coercive. We cannot force people who don't want to change to change. It doesn't work. So here are some examples of what pre-contemplation sounds like. Stopping using is not important to me right now. I do not want to get tested. There is no point in talking about this, okay? All really good examples of pre-contemplation. Folks are making themselves perfectly clear. They are not interested in making a change. Contemplation. Contemplation acknowledges that there's a problem and maybe they're thinking about making a change. So in the contemplation stage, you'll hear a lot of pros and cons or decisional balance. Um, so I would love to go to the gym, but I work late and I don't have time in the morning or I would, I, I don't know, I like I thought about smoking cigarettes or about stopping smoking cigarettes, but I, I really get stressed out when I, when I am not able to smoke or, or maybe it's, I do want to use it or I, like, I know I should use a, a sterile syringe every time, but man, I can't make it to the syringe service program when it's open. Um, people might not fully understand the benefits of changing and might not see ways to deal with the barriers. Uh, ambivalence is really characteristic of the contemplation stage. So people are feeling conflicted. Um, 
chronic contemplators will find it really difficult to leave this chain, this stage. So people who chronically feel that ambivalence or are, are very much tied up in ambivalence and internal conflict um, might really struggle to leave this contemplation stage. Contemplation sounds like these statements though, or questions. What will happen if I decide to seek treatment, right? So someone's trying to figure out what might happen if they decide to go to detox or rehab or seek medication. I want to stop using, but I can't if I'm living on the street. I have to find somewhere to live. So someone is interested in stopping using, but there's a really, really big barrier. I know it's important to get tested, but I'm not sure I'm comfortable yet, right? So acknowledging the importance of getting tested, but also being really open and honest about their, their feeling around it and their trepidation. So now let's move into preparation. Participants in the preparation stage are planning to make a change in their behavior in the very near future. So they are making that checklist of things to do. They maybe have made slight changes in an effort to test out the effects and then they begin solidifying plans to help them make the change, right? So maybe it's someone who wants to quit smoking as part of their preparation has stopped having their morning cigarette. So preparation sounds like I thought my hep C would clear on its own. I guess now I finally have to start doing something about it. So preparing to seek hep C treatment, right? Acknowledging that, you know, for some people hep C does clear on its own. This person has, I, as part of, maybe as part of their, those small preparation steps, this person has finally gotten their viral load test and now they are preparing to seek treatment. I need to start taking care, better care of myself. I should make time to come to the exchange if I'm out of needles instead of reusing. So maybe this is that person who says that the exchange is too far and the hours are too limited. Maybe they're thinking, you know what? I, my work is closer to the exchange than my home. Maybe I can stop by on my lunch break. Or, you know, they're starting to think through how they might better, or how they might be able to make that change or better apply that change. Would I be able to bring my partner with me to this appointment, right? So this feels more like preparation than the, when the question in contemplation where it's when, what will happen if I do decide to go to this appointment, right? This is making actual plans. I'm planning on bringing my partner to this appointment if I can. Action. So when clients actually do what they're planning to do, that, that simple and also that difficult, um, people engage in a new behavior and they maybe reward themselves for the success, successes that they're experiencing. And they also are learning to deal with, with any challenges that this new behavior presents. So action might sound like, I went to the doctor today. It wasn't as bad as I thought. So they're recognizing, they went to the doctor, they made that change, and they're recognizing, wow, it, it wasn't as bad as I had expected it to be. It also could hear, or could sound like, I've been on Suboxone for a week, I don't know if I like it, and I've used a couple times, but for now I'm sticking with it, right? So someone has taken the action to get Suboxone, they have been taking Suboxone for a, about a week, they're not sure how they feel about it. It feels maybe challenging to them to be on Suboxone, but they're sticking with it for now, even if they've used a couple times. They still want to be in the action phase with Suboxone. I'm getting a Narcan kit and teaching my roommate to use it today because I don't want to overdose. So someone is in action in terms of making sure that they have an overdose prevention plan, right? They are taking steps, taking active steps to make sure other people in their household know how to reverse an overdose. Maintenance. Maintenance means that the person is continuing to change their behavior, continuing with their behavior change. 
So they're working to integrate and firmly establish the change into their lifestyle. So maintenance might sound like, so I gotta get tested every three months to stay on prep. It's been annoying, but you know what? I'm dealing with it. Or, or maintenance might sound hostile sometimes. Maybe it's, hey man, I have been using a sterile syringe every time I shoot for a decade. I don't need a lecture from you, right? I am in maintenance with using sterile syringes. That is my behavior change. I don't need to hear about what you think my behavior change should be. I still use on weekends sometimes, but I've been using subs during the work week for three years now and I still have a job. I really like this one as an illustration of maintenance because it demonstrates that maintenance that, again, goals do not have to be black and white. This person's goal was not to, this person's goal was not to stop using all the time. This person's goal was to make sure that they feel stable and are using Suboxone during the work week, that they are still able to use on the weekends if they want to. These are the kinds of goals that motivational interviewing can help achieve. Finally, relapse, returning to a previous stage. So it means just that the participant returns to an earlier stage. They may relapse to more than one stage. So they may relapse back to contemplation and then fall back to pre-contemplation. Who knows? Um, and we need to normalize this process because it reduces that sense of hopelessness that is often associated with lapse or relapse and the inability to change behavior. So this is what I was talking about earlier where we need to you know, if someone has a lapse from their behavior change, we need to say, that's okay. What were you doing before that worked? So relapse might sound like my husband and I got divorced and things have been pretty rough. I've been using every day again to deal with it. So it sounds like this person was not using every day. We don't know how often this person was or was not using given their behavior change, but they've experienced a traumatic life event and they've gone back to contemplation. Or it might sound like my meds ran out and I didn't pick up a new prescription. I don't know how to get back on track now, right? So someone's been on medication for maybe HIV medication, maybe Suboxone for a while um, because they've been in, let's say they've been in action in this stage, not in maintenance. They've been on their meds for only about two months and they've run out and they didn't pick up their new prescription. Now they're trying to figure out how to get back on track. So maybe they're in preparation with trying to figure out how to get back on track. Maybe talking to you is part of preparation for quote, getting back on track. So now let's talk about change talk. Um, how do you know when a person is moving closer to actually making the change they've been talking about? Well, we have this darn C acronym, um, which stands for desire, ability, reasons, need, and commitment. So you want to look for language that indicates desire. So I want to, or I'm thinking I could, or I need to, right? Ability, I can, I could. Reasons, I should because. This will change if, you know? Needs, I have to, I need to. I, I have to make this change or I will keep feeling really sick. I, I need to make this change or I don't know what will happen. You know, the, that's, that's need talk. And then commitment. I will go buy those nicotine patches today. Or I will see if there's, an, if there's a harm reduction program in my area that has better hours. Um, if you hear this change talk, this I want to, I can, I should, I have to, I will, 
of great ideas to get more info. As a, but so if you're the provider and you hear, you know, I really, I really should get tested for Hep C because I just had three friends who tested reactive for Hep C, uh, but I'm but I'm nervous about it and I. I don't know. I'm really careful with uh, making sure I only use my own supplies. Then maybe you as a provider say, okay, tell me more about why you think you should get that hep C test then, or tell me more about why you are thinking of getting that hep C test if you, like, given that you do always use your own supplies, right? Or so you want to get a hep C test, even though you use all your own supplies. Did I hear you right? Is there something that I missed there? And can you give me more information? That's a really good way to respond to this change talk. Another acronym in addition to darn C that we use in motivational interviewing is ORS. So ORS is, stands for open-ended questions affirmations, reflections, and summary. This is the way that you want to communicate with your participants. So open-ended questions. Uh, they facilitate dialogue in a neutral way. Open-ended questions encourage the client to do the majority of the talking and to keep motivation or communication moving forward. And they often begin with what, why, how, or describe. The point of open-ended questions is A, to get as much information about the situation as possible from the participant, and B, to allow the participant to do the majority of the talking. So here's some demonstrations of leading and close-ended questions, questions that you want to avoid. You don't, any, you don't have any problems with talking about Suboxone, right? Or maybe another leading question would be, I mean, you know all the health risks associated with smoking, right? Do you have any problems with seeing our Suboxone prescriber? That's a close-ended question. There are only two answers to that, yes or no. Do you have any problems with, with buying a nicotine patch? Again, two, two answers, yes or no. Open-ended would be, what are your thoughts about meeting with a Suboxone doctor this week? What are your thoughts about trying nicotine gum? It allows the participant to give you more than just a yes or no answer and to talk through honestly what they're actually thinking about the change that you're asking them about. Affirmations. So these are statements or gestures that recognize clients' strengths and acknowledge their positive behaviors and the behaviors that lead to positive change, no matter the size of those behaviors. And affirmations have to be genuine. People can tell when you're lying to them. People can tell when you're saying a compliment just to say a compliment. You want to be genuine. So examples of affirmations, I really appreciate that you're willing to meet with me today. Maybe this is said to someone who has been avoiding talking with you for a while or someone who's really busy and isn't often able to make it down to your office. You're a very resourceful person. Maybe you say this to someone who has been reusing their syringes um, or has been sharing syringes, right? Wow, you've been sharing syringes, but you're, you've been making sure to do so in a place where you at least always have water to flush out the syringes. That's really resourceful of you to seek out places where you can, if you have to share, share in a way that is safer. Um, or I've enjoyed talking to you today. It can be that simple. It really can. Um, affirmations also include saying, uh, include affirming past behavior that has been associated with this change, like I've been talking about throughout this webinar, right? So you've done this before. You have five years without using cocaine. That's something to be proud of. These are affirmations as well. Uh, you want to practice reflective listening. So 
you want to listen and respond based on your observation of your participants' verbal and nonverbal responses in any possible meaning. And you also want to check with them rather than assuming that you know what they mean. Repeat, rephrase, paraphrase, or reflect a feeling. So, so you feel so you feel like nicotine gum hasn't been working for you. Did I get that right? It sounds like you are really busy at home and it's really hard for you to make it down to the to the harm reduction program when it's open. You're wondering if you will have to go get another test if you test reactive to this HIV test. Is that right? Those are some examples of reflective listening. Summaries are the last of the ORS tools, right? So they are a type of reflective listening that's useful at beginnings, transition points, and ends of conversation. So again, they are checking that you understand what your participant is saying rather than assuming you know what they meant. Um, it, the best way to structure summaries is to begin with a summary, point out any change talk, highlight ambivalence, and end with an invitation to tell you more, right? So I've heard that you would be interested in quitting using heroin if you were housed. But right now, you're not sure that quitting heroin makes sense for you because of the way that it keeps you warm and it makes you feel like you're full and allows you to sleep when you're living on the street. Did I miss anything? Or let me see if I understand so far. You have thought about quitting smoking because you've been coughing a lot lately and you think your cigarette smoking might be related to that. But cigarette, but smoking cigarettes is a really big de-stressor for you and you're worried that if you were to quit, you wouldn't have another way to wind down. What are other points to consider here? Good ways to build a summary. Finally, I want to um, introduce two scales that can help you figure out, uh, help you explore whether your participant really is wanting to change. So on a scale from zero to 10, where zero is not at all important and 10 is extremely important, where are you feeling stopping smoking is? And then people can give you zero through 10 answers, right? If someone says four, then maybe they're willing to explore a little bit. Maybe they are having some ambivalence. If someone says zero, then they don't want to quit smoking or it's not important enough to focus on right now and maybe there's something else that you can work on. And then confidence scale. Like we said in the beginning, people need to have positive self-esteem in order to change. We want our participants to have positive self-regard and we want to assess how confident they're feeling around their changes. So on a scale from zero to 10, where zero is not at all important and 10 is extremely important, where are you in terms of confidence about making this change? How confident are you around making this change? Someone says zero, it's not at all confident. Okay, what are the barriers you're experiencing around feeling confidence around making this change? Can you tell me a little bit more about why you're not feeling so confident? Or if someone says 10, that's, that's great. Wow, you're feeling really, really confident. What What's making you feel so confident that you're going to be able to achieve this change, right? Keep the conversation going regardless, but confidence scales and important scales are really, are both really good tools to start conversation. All right, so now we're going to practice flipping closed-ended questions into open-ended questions. Below are some closed-ended questions. Think about how to open them up. I'm going to read the list, then you can think about how to open them up, then I'm going to give some examples or an example for each about how I would open them up 
there is certainly more than one way to open up all of these questions. Do you hate using condoms? Do you share injection equipment? Are you afraid to get tested for HIV? Do you want to get tested for Hep C? Do you like methadone? Did you like methadone the last time you tried it? Do you have a safe place to use? These are all yes or no questions, right? And I lied to you earlier, I'm gonna give you two examples of ways to flip the question. But again, there are many more than that. So again, if you have a sheet of notebook paper in front of you, maybe write down how you might open these questions. If you don't, just think about it. Do you hate using condoms? Do you share injection equipment? Are you afraid to get tested for HIV? Do you want to get tested or treated for hep C? Did you like methadone the last time you tried it? Do you have a safe place to use? Do you hate using condoms can be turned into, tell me what it's like for you to use condoms or what don't you like about condoms? Both of these are questions with a lot more answers than just yes or no. Or, well, one's a statement, but both of these are prompts with a lot more answers than just yes or no. Do you share injection equipment? When's the last time you shared a cooker and can you tell me about it? Can you tell me about why you were sharing the cooker? When's the last time you shared a cooker is actually a closed question, but when's the last time and can you tell me about it? Open. What reasons have you had for sharing injection equipment in the past, right? So exploring why people have shared injection equipment in the past. Are you afraid to get tested for HIV? How are you feeling about testing for HIV, right? Allows for a lot more than just yes or no, allows for a discussion about feelings and emotions. Can you tell me about the last time you were tested for HIV? Again, asking for previous experiences. And then the other three, do you wanna get treated for hep C? What have you heard about hep C treatment, right? So exploring what people know or don't know making sure that people have that knowledge and that competency. Can you tell me why you haven't been treated for hepatitis C yet? Also a great question. Maybe this is a person who's been living with hep C for a while and doesn't know about the new medications. Maybe this is a person who has been treated for hep C and has contracted hep C again. Lots to unpack there, lots to learn. Did you, la did you like methadone the last time you tried it? What, if anything, worked for you about methadone when you took it last? So allowing for a lot of explanation around what worked and what didn't maybe, or why did you decide to stop taking methadone? Do you have a safe place to use? Tell me a little bit about the last place you used. Again, a, more of a statement prompt than a question, but this is a really great way to learn about people's use habits, right? It's a really great way to learn whether people have access to a sterile water supply. It's a great way to learn if people are using alone or with friends, if people carry naloxone when they use, if they have experienced a recent overdose. Lots could potentially come from that answer. Or how do you normally pick a place to use? So figuring out how that person goes through the process of picking a place to use. All right, we're wrapping up. So here are some final tips that we have. Motivational interviewing is non-coercive. The type and timing of change is always up to the participant. It is not a provider's job to force change. Resistance is normal and it's a part of the process of change. So roll with it. One lapse doesn't mean that the person can't return to any other stage quickly or even immediately. Lapse does not mean that people have to go straight back into pre-contemplation. Keep your questions open-ended if you can, or try prompts rather than questions. And then change talk sounds different than sustained talk. Change talk will include lots of ambivalence and conflict. Sustained talk will be definite I am going to keep doing this or I am not going to do that. 
thank you so much for your time and for watching this workshop. Um, I hope that it's been helpful. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to, uh, to BHSB. Our websites are harmreduction.org and behavioralhealthservicesbaltimore.org. And you can find lots more webinars and information at both sites. Thanks so much.